Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware, we have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit, but frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to Just Keep Rolling, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Ellen, my co-host is Katie, and with our powers combined, we are Just Keep Rolling. Really? Uh Uh-huh. You try coming up with a different, okay, you do it, but (laughs) it's hard. That's what she said. (laughs) And speaking of Just Keep Rolling, let's just roll right into the rolling rehash. Last week, we covered the second half of Chapter 8, the hearing and the corresponding film scenes. Fudge is pig-headed and on the verge of having a cow. Umbridge is toad-faced and far too much of an eager beaver when it comes to ruining a teenager. Dumbledore is eagle-eyed when it comes to spotting legal fuckery, and silver-tongued when it comes to making his point. And, after being cleared of all charges, Harry's just left feeling like a monkey's uncle. During episode 131, totally the theme, our Potter pondering was, what did you miss from Harry's trial scene in the movie? Hey Ellen, hey Katie, Jackson here with this week's pondering. What did I miss from Harry's trial in Order of the Phoenix? Uh, Where do I start? I mean, they got the basic thing across, but there was so much left out. Fudge's blustering, his trying to bring up past events, like blowing up Aunt Marge and the hover charm. I mean, even his disregard for the testimony of Dobby. You know, I haven't got time to listen to house elves. It's not only more detail, but it actually shines truth on what Dumbledore said to Fudge at the end of Goblet of Fire about Fudge might act progressive, but he falls into the ridiculousness of the so-called purity of blood and the treatment of magical creatures. What else did I miss? Dumbledore's calmness, his way of reacting to Fudge. There was so much left out. Hi, Ellen and Katie. This is Ashley with this week's Potter Pondering. What parts from the trial did I miss in the movies that should have been there? I could really open the file on this, even though this is probably one of the better scenes. I'm going to go with Dumbledore's demeanor, even though they just keeping up the character now because they already didn't turn them into the grumpy old man last season. I guess that's his baseline now, huh? And just anger when Book Dumbledore is stoic, refined, unbothered. That's why he can crawl all under Fudge's skin like that. Tch, bruh, do you know who I am? Dumbledore, you hear me? Headmaster, you hear me? I could take your job if I wanted to. Best be glad I don't, you hear me? Wink. That's the demo door we get. Not on TV, though. We got... Here you put your name in the goblet of fire! Yo, it's Quincy, and I'm calling in my Potter Pondering. Today, we're going to talk about disrespect. Disrespecting the source material when you had all this beautiful, beautiful material to work from. And what do you give us from the trial? Shit. You gave us shit didn't give us anything. It was very frustrating to watch that part of the movie because, like, you were wondering where Dobby was. You were wondering where the, the like, nice armchair was. Uh, you were wondering why Madame Bones was, like, so stiff. In the books, she was not that stiff. Yes, she was a severe woman, but she was, like, you know, questioning him. She was impressed by certain things that he's done. And... Like, you were just missing all of that from the movies. And I was a little butthurt about it. I was, I'm not going to lie. I was a little butthurt. I was mad. I was upset. And it's one of the reasons why Order of the Phoenix is one of my least favorite movies of all time. Not just from the Harry Potter franchise. It's of all time. That's all. Thank you so much for your responses. Our trivia question last week was... Where does Mr. Weasley have to go for the regurgitating toilet? 
Mr. Weasley says he will take Harry straight back on his way to the toilet in Bethnal Green. Congratulations goes to Sarah Baines Miller. Woohoo! Starting up a new streak. Will she keep it going? We shall see. For now, let's just keep rolling into the first half of Chapter 9, The Woes of Mrs. Weasley and the absolutely no corresponding film scenes. Chapter 9, The Woes of Mrs. Weasley, Part 1 Harry is relieved, but also completely surprised at Dumbledore's abrupt exit, and remains sitting in the chain chair, unsure if he's allowed to leave or not. Since everyone in the Wizengamot is chatting and not paying him any attention, he gets up and walks tentatively towards the door. When no one calls him back, he speeds up his walk until he is basically running out the door. He nearly collides with a very pale Mr. Weasley, who mentions that Dumbledore didn't say anything, and Harry tells him that he was cleared of all charges. Mr. Weasley tells him how wonderful that is, and begins to say that he knew they couldn't have found him guilty, not with the evidence. He cuts himself off when the courtroom door opens and the Wizengamot begins to file out, and he realizes that Harry was tried by the full court. Some of the witches and wizards acknowledge them as they pass, but most of them avert their eyes. When Fudge and the toad-like witch exit, the minister completely ignores them, but the witch gives Harry an appraising sort of look. Percy marches past them, completely ignoring his father, and the tightening of Mr. Weasley's mouth is the only sign that he sees his third son walking by. He tells Harry that he's going to take him back to Grimmauld Place on his way to that regurgitating toilet in Bethnal Green. Now that Harry knows he's going back to Hogwarts, everything seems five times funnier and he grins as he asks what Mr. Weasley will have to do about the toilet. Mr. Weasley explains that it's a simple counter jinx as they head back up the stairs and stops talking when they reach level nine and find the minister standing a few feet away talking with a sleek blonde haired man. They both look at Harry, and Lucius Malvoy greets him by calling him Patronus Potter. Harry feels winded to see the man he last saw in a dark graveyard after Lord Voldemort's return, talking to the Minister of Magic when just weeks ago Harry had told him Malfoy was a Death Eater. Lucius brings up how the Minister was just telling him about his lucky escape, calling it astonishing and snake-like. Mr. Weasley grips Harry's shoulder in warning, and Harry just says he's good at escaping. Lucius then turns to Arthur and asks him what he's doing there. When Mr. Weasley coolly reminds him that he works there, Malfoy makes a snide comment about it not being there, surely, sarcastically commenting that didn't he do something that involves sneaking muggle artifacts home and enchanting them? Mr. Weasley gives a curt no, and Harry speaks up to ask Mr. Malfoy what he is doing there. Malfoy smooths his robes, causing a large amount of gold to clink, as he tells him that his private matters with the minister don't concern him, and he shouldn't expect the same indulgence from everyone just because he's Dumbledore's favorite. He then turns to the minister and suggests that they go up to his office. Fudge agrees, and the two stride off talking in low voices. Mr. Weasley keeps his hand on Harry's shoulder until they're out of sight, and then Harry immediately bursts out about what he was doing down there and not waiting up at the minister's office. Mr. Weasley is sure that he was trying to sneak down to the courtroom to find out the results of Harry's trial, and also says he will leave a note for Dumbledore so he knows Malfoy's been talking to Fudge again. As they wait for the lift, Harry wonders what private business they have together, and Mr. Weasley angrily expects that it's about gold and mentions how Malfoy is so well connected. They enter the lift and Harry asks how they know that the Death Eaters haven't put the Imperious Curse on Fudge if he's meeting with them in private, and Mr. Weasley says that it's definitely occurred to them, but at this point Dumbledore thinks he's acting of his own accord, which isn't exactly comforting. He tells Harry they best not discuss it now as the lift stops at the atrium level. As they head to the security station past the Golden Fountain, Harry remembers his promise to put in ten galleons and pulls out his money bag, instead deciding to dump all of his money in the pool at the foot of the statue. 
When Harry enters the kitchen back at Grimmauld Place and tells everyone the good news, Ron yells that he knew it, and Hermione, though still looking extremely anxious, says that they were bound to clear him since there was no case against him at all. Harry points out how relieved everyone seems, considering they all knew he'd get off, and smiles as he watches Mrs. Weasley wipe her face with her apron, and Fred, George, and Ginny perform a kind of war dance while chanting, He got off, he got off, he got off. Mr. Weasley is also smiling, but has to shout multiple times for his children to quiet down, so he can tell Sirius about seeing Lucius Malfoy at the Ministry. Sirius tells him that he'll let Dumbledore know, and Mr. Weasley heads out to address the vomiting toilet in Bethnal Green. Fred, George, and Ginny are still chanting, and Mrs. Weasley has to again tell them to be quiet. She then invites Harry to have a proper breakfast, since he hardly ate anything before, and they all happily sit at the table, discussing how Dumbledore's present swung it for him. Though Harry finds himself thinking that he wished he would have taken the time to talk to him, or even look at him. His thoughts are interrupted by a pain in his scar, but Hermione is the only one who notices him clap his hand to his forehead, as everyone else is still celebrating his win. Ron thinks Dumbledore will show up to celebrate with them that night, but Mrs. Weasley says she thinks he will be too busy to attend. She then again has to yell at the twins and her daughter, since their chanting has only gotten louder. Over the next few days, Harry notices that Sirius isn't as happy as everyone else is that Harry wasn't expelled. He put on a good show at first, but has since become moodier and spends more time shut up in his mother's room with Buckbeak. As they clean out a moldy cupboard, Hermione tells Harry not to feel guilty, because Sirius knows that he belongs at Hogwarts and is just being selfish. Ron thinks that she's being a bit harsh, since he understandably just doesn't want to be stuck in the house without company. The three continue discussing as they work until Mrs. Weasley enters the bedroom to check their progress. As Ron complains that he was hoping she came to tell them that they could have a break, she reminds him that he wanted to help the Order, and can do his bit by making headquarters fit to live in. Ron grumbles that he feels like a house elf, which sets Hermione off about SPEW. As the holidays are nearing their end, Harry finds himself daydreaming more and more about Hogwarts, though he is very careful not to mention any of it in front of Sirius. Living at the headquarters of the anti-Voldemort movement is not nearly as exciting as Harry would have thought, and nobody, not even Sirius, offers him any more information beyond what he got the first night there. On the last morning of the holidays, their book lists arrive, and they find that they only have to buy two new books, The Standard Book of Spells Grade 5 by Miranda Goshawk, and Defensive Magical Theory by Wilbert Slinkhard. Fred and George apparate in beside Harry, who isn't even phased by this anymore, and mentions that they wonder who assigned the sling card book, since they heard Dumbledore was having a really hard time filling the defense against the Dark Arts position. Fred then notices that Ron is standing very still, gaping at his Hogwarts letter, and moves around him to look at the letter too. His mouth also drops when he realizes that Ron has been made a prefect. George leaps forward to grab the envelope, and a scarlet and gold pin falls into his hand. The twins are both shocked, saying that no one in their right mind would make Ron a prefect, and that they had been sure that Harry was a cert. They ultimately decide that all the mad stuff must have counted against him after all, but also groan about how revolting their mum is going to be about the news. George thrusts the badge back at Ron, who is still speechless, and holds it out for Harry to inspect. At this point, Hermione bursts into the room, sees Harry with the badge, and shrieks that she knew it. She holds out her own letter and tells him that she is a prefect too. Harry quickly shoves the badge back into Ron's hand and explains that it's Ron, not him. Hermione tries but fails to hide her surprise and is saved when Mrs. Weasley enters the room with a pile of freshly laundered robes. She asks for the book list so she can pick up their books that afternoon, and also mentions that she'll have to get Ron some new pajamas, since his are about six inches too short. She asks what color he would like, and George smirks, telling her to get him red and gold to match his badge. Mrs. Weasley absently asks, match his what? And with the air of getting it over with, Fred tells her that they mean his lovely shiny new prefix badge. Mrs. Weasley shrieks with joy and is so excited she even briefly forgets that Fred and George are part of the family too. She raves about how proud she is of Ron as she hugs and kisses him, and then asks what he would like as a reward. 
Ron hopefully asks for a new broom and clarifies that he doesn't mean a really good one, just a new one, when her face falls. Mrs. Weasley hesitates, but then smiles and agrees. She reminds them all to pack their trunks, kisses Ron on the cheek again, and bustles out of the room. Fred and George begin teasing their younger brother, but are also beginning to realize the perks of having their brother be a prefect, joking that their law-breaking days are finally over. They disapparate with a crack, and as the trio hears them laughing hysterically through the ceiling, Hermione tells Ron not to pay them any attention, since they are just jealous. Ron doesn't think they are, though feeling happier, he does point out that they have never had new brooms before. He knows his mom will never be able to afford a Nimbus, but decides the new clean sweep will be great, and decides to go tell her that he'd like that one. He dashes from the room, leaving Harry and Hermione behind. So, obviously, we have no movie scenes here. No. Yet it was still, according to my iPad that I have the EPUB file on, Mm -hmm. 25 pages long chapter. That's quite a chapter. Oh, it was a long chapter. So we still had to split this in half, even though we don't have movie scenes. And you know what? This might still be a long episode in itself because there was a lot to read. A lot of stuff went down. Yeah. And I can kind of see why some of this wasn't included, Mm -hmm. especially in the second half of this one. We'll talk more about that next week. But at this point, it's backstory. Yeah. It's fun. Mm -hmm. I think some of this definitely could have at least been mentioned, but I could see it not getting a full section of the movie. Yeah, it's a little bit of a filler. Yeah. The second section has a little bit more of a tendency to backstory. Mm -hmm. This one is kind of filler information, but there are some things that should have been in there. Yeah, definitely. Which we'll point out as we get to it. Mm -hmm. So the chapter started off right at the end of Harry's trial. And he has this weird blend of feelings because he's so relieved he hasn't been expelled. But at the same time, Dumbledore just ignored the shit out of him. Mm -hmm. Like, what the fuck? Yeah. And he at least showed up. Yeah. So there's that. But how did he not look at him? And at this point, Harry has no idea why. It's got to be a weird emotion thing for him. He's got to be like, does my breath smell? Like, do I have something in my teeth? What's? (sighs) Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. Like sniffing his hand. Like... Do I offend? <laughs> Sniffing his pits? Yeah. <laughs> what did I do? I swear Mrs. Weasley cleaned my clothes. I took yeah. a shower. <laughs> Why won't he talk to me? You're like, what on earth is going on here? Because he didn't even glance in my direction. Yeah. And then on top of that, he's not sure. Like, nobody's dismissed him. He has no idea what's going on if he's allowed to leave, if he's expected to do anything else. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody in the Wizengamot's paying attention to him. So he's just like, doo 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 and just starts tentatively sneaking towards the door. And nobody says anything to him. So he literally just takes off running until he gets out of the room. <laughs> that sounds like me. <laughs> Minus the running, but the idea of the running is there. You would have been mentally running. <laughs> yes, definitely. i had been like walking at a very brisk pace. Like, God, hopefully nobody catches up to me. Hopefully, Don't I... look at me. Don't look at me. Don't look at me. Don't look at me. I hope I didn't have to like sign a paper or something. Like, right. <laughs> but he makes it out the door and nearly collides with a very pale Mr. Weasley who apparently didn't really get anything told to him by Dumbledore either. Or maybe Dumbledore thought Harry would want to share the news for himself. Maybe. I don't know. But he's just like, Dumbledore didn't say anything. What Mm -hmm. happened? What happened? What happened? And (laughs) Harry's just like, cleared! (laughs) (laughs) Hands up in the air and everything. That's what I like to believe. (laughs) And then, of course, Mr. Weasley thinks that's wonderful and goes into the theme of this part of the chapter where he's just like i mean i knew they couldn't have found you guilty not with the evidence but i can't pretend that i wasn't worried yeah (laughs) it's kind of the theme of the whole book isn't it (laughs) true story (laughs) maybe even the whole series yeah well there's that too but then he has to cut himself off because at this point the entire Wizengamot starts to file out of the courtroom. Uh-huh. And it's the same door that Harry just exited. So remember how we were speculating that maybe Corny Fudge <laughs> had a different entrance and that's how he got there before Harry when he was talking with Lucius. Not- no, yeah, apparently all not. one door. No, nope. all one door. Just had to point that out. I mean, maybe he had a special fudge entrance. I think that's usually <laughs> an exit. <laughs> Very well pointed out, Ellen. Remember, I should have been a Ravenclaw. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure. 
<laughs> but anyway, Arthur's like watching all of these witches and wizards file out the door. Mm-hmm. And I just imagine him like eyes, 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 just like following <laughs> as each one comes out. He's like, Merlin's beard, were you tried by the full court? Yes. Yes, I was actually. Well, mm. Harry's really more of a like, I guess so. Because yeah. he has no idea what's going on. He's Harry. Oh, yeah. He doesn't have anything to compare it to. No. So, yeah. And then some of the members of the Wizengamot actually do acknowledge him and Harry as they walk by. Madame Bones even says hello to Arthur. Mm-hmm. But most of them, like, avert their eyes. Mainly the ones that voted. Oh, for sure. <laughs> against him. For sure those six that voted against him, or approximately six. Right. The very last ones to exit were Fudge and the Toad-like Witch, which I love the fact that the book keeps describing her as the Toad-like Witch. Like, we know her name, but at this point, she has not earned that. Yeah. She is insignificant. The book really wants to hammer home that this bitch looks like a frog. Yep. Like, facts. Rip bit. <laughs> <laughs> and then to follow suit with the other members who voted against Harry, Fudge completely ignores them. Of course. But the witch actually gives Harry a sort of, the book says, a praising look. So, I don't know, she's just like sizing him up. Yeah. So the way I see this happening, because the book says that Fudge and the toad-like witch were the last to exit... Mm -hmm. And then they pass Harry and Mr. Weasley and ignore him. But then when Percy passes. So I just see Percy doing his usual brown nose thing there and holding the door open mm -hmm. for everyone. Yeah. Or maybe he just wanted to hold it for one person, but then everyone just started walking through. No, Percy totally held it for every single one of them <laughs> and probably was just like, oh, you're welcome. Oh, you're welcome. Oh, yeah. No, have a great day to mm -hmm. every single one of them by name if he could. Percy Weasley, you're welcome. Percy Weasley, you're welcome. Percy Weasley, you're welcome. Percy Weatherby, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Anywho, he is the last one to actually walk past his dad and Harry. Mm -hmm. So I just like to imagine him holding the door. Yeah. And then once the minister and the toad-like witch are out, he's able to let the door close and then just diligently, eyes straight ahead, refuses to look at his father. Yeah. And Mr. Weasley... Pointedly. Yeah. Pointedly refuses to even glance his way pretends he's not there just marches right past mm -hmm. and mr weasley basically follows suit but harry sees his mouth tighten just a little bit mm -hmm. which is the only acknowledgement that his middle son just walked by you know yeah. without so much as a how do you fucking do you know yeah it's kind of messy right there mm-hmm but he takes it in stride and he just tells Harry, I'm going to take you straight back so you can tell everybody the good news. And I'll just do that on my way to the regurgitating toilet in Bethnal Green. Which was our trivia question. Sure was. Mm -hmm. Now, mentioning the regurgitating toilet again, when Harry is no longer convinced he's about to be expelled from Hogwarts, mm -hmm. has made everything seem five times funnier. <laughs> and he's just like, he, 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 regurgitating toilets. <laughs> so what are you going to have to do about that? And he's just grinning. Yeah. Because what teenage boy doesn't like a poop joke? I mean, I would venture that it's not strictly just teenage boys. Okay, I'm sorry. What person with a sense of humor doesn't like a poop joke? <laughs> <laughs> well apparently none of them <laughs> so there you go uh -huh. but mr weasley starts explaining that fixing the toilet's not the issue because it's just a simple counter jinx the real problem is the fact that there's this whole anti-muggle attitude that you can't really just fix with a simple counter jinx mm -hmm. the fact that people are making toilets spew shit at muggles because they think that's funny is literally a hashtag shit show. Yeah, it very much is. It is a very shitty thing to do. Yeah. So the actual action of the toilet spewing upon random muggles isn't the worst part. It's... The intention. The intention. It's what you do about that intention, too. Yeah. It's so shitty. Pardon the pun. No pardon. <laughs> I have to, otherwise I'll kill you, Ellen. <laughs> Don't kill me. <laughs> Well, I then still I'm... have to edit these episodes. <laughs> well, then I'm pardoning your pun. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he stops explaining all of this to Harry because they get up to the top of the steps that they had to go down. Mm -hmm. In the book. In the book. <laughs> and when they're back at the actual level nine department of mysteries, they find the minister standing 
just a few feet away from him at the top of those stairs with a sleek, blonde-haired man hmm. that we could also say could be called Nazi von Douchebag the first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is the part that the movie vaguely referenced before Harry's trial when he and Mr. Weasley saw them chatting up in the corridor. But it was definitely vague compared to this. Yeah. You couldn't really hear what they were saying. Yeah. And again, the timing was just so weird. Mm hmm. This does make more sense. Yeah. And it gets addressed more, obviously, as we're about to address it. <laughs> does it? Yes, let's go on. Are you going to address it? Address it, Katie. I said address <laughs> it. But yeah, it's definitely much more vague in the movie. And this one actually gives you the reason why he's there. It's not at a weird time before Harry's trial that doesn't explain how Harry got there and Fudge was already there. And Yeah. It makes more sense here. Mm -hmm. And we actually get to hear some of what they're talking about and see a direct interaction. As opposed to half a line. Yeah. Completely out of context, yeah. So as soon as they see Arthur and Harry reach the top of the stairs, they both stop what they're doing and just look over at him. Yeah, like you do. And Nazi von Douchebag the first is just like, well, 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 if it isn't Patronus Potter. So now we know where his son gets all his lame ass insults. It makes so much sense. Training right? for the ballet, Potter. Mm-hmm. Oi, Scarhead. Yeah. Mm. The apple does not fall far from the tree here. No. Patronus Potter. That's actually kind of a badass nickname. Thanks, man. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Except that that's not really where Harry's mindset is because the last time that he saw this man and heard his voice, it was in the motherfucking graveyard when Voldemort had just returned. Mm -hmm. And he could hear that voice jeering as Voldemort fucking tortured him. Yeah. So this is more like a punch in the fucking gut. Yeah. And he's not thinking about the cool new nickname he just got. Wow. He's more thinking about, motherfucker, just weeks ago, I told you that that man was a fucking Death Eater. And you're meeting with him in private? Mm-hmm. Like, if there was any question as to what's going on with you before, it's answered now. Like, hello, we know you are suspicious. Yeah. Like, you've got to be fucking kidding me, dude. You want to go have tea with Voldemort, too, while you're at it? Might as well. Well, he couldn't do that because that's just a figment of Harry and Dumbledore's imagination. That is true. Give it a few months, though. <laughs> right? <laughs> so Nazi von Douchebag's just like, the minister's been telling me all about your lucky escape. It's astonishing how you keep managing to get out of things. One might even call it snake-like. Like, who the fuck you calling a snake, motherfucker? Like, first off, that would normally be a compliment from you. Like, you're the snake. You are a snake guy, not me. Are you telling me that I am Slytherin quality? What, like, what are you trying to get at here, yeah. man? Like, not entirely sure where you're going with this line again, of insulting. Bad at insulting. Yeah, terrible It is at just it. not a von douchebag trait. No, it's sad. Mr. Weasley just, like, clamps down on Harry's shoulder and just squeezes Mm -hmm. Like, don't say anything, don't say anything, don't say anything. And Harry's just like, yep, I'm good at escaping. <laughs> Lucky me. Woohoo. Mm -hmm. So instead, Nazi von Douchebag the first decides he's going to pick on Mr. Weasley instead. And he's just like, what are you doing here? Arthur's just like, um, hello, I work here. Mm -hmm. And douchebag's like well not here surely don't you work up on level two isn't your job something to do with taking home muggle artifacts and enchanting them this boy is one to talk <laughs> i do not like this man <laughs> no well to be fair we're not supposed to so... yeah no i know it's effective yeah <laughs> but i am kind of disappointed that we did not get this level of confrontation in the movie no yeah like we got this hint to it yeah, they could have done such a great throwback to Chamber, too. Yeah. When there was that standoff between Arthur and Lucius yeah, in the bookstore. Yeah, and this one shows some real growth with Arthur because he didn't attack him. Mm -hmm. He just gives a very curt no. Yep. And then, you know, Harry James meddling Marie Potter has to speak up and say, well, what are you doing here? Like, you don't even <laughs> work anywhere in this building. And Malfoy's just like... <clears throat> 
My business with the minister is none of your business. And as he smooths his robes out, there's the sound of a large amount of gold clanking within his robes. Mm hmm. Gee, I wonder what he's there for. Gee, I wonder. Hmm. He also goes on to tell him that just because he's Dumbledore's favorite boy doesn't mean he should expect the same level of indulgence from everyone. Motherfucker, I'm Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> I am Harry James meddling Marie Potter. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he then turns to the minister as if he's not the one who came down there to find him and says, maybe we should go up to your office now. Fucking weirdo dude and fudge is just like yes let's do that and the two stride off continuing to talk in their low voices and that's like that part is basically all the movie kind of gave us yeah but then the timing was off i know i keep saying that but it was off i didn't like it <laughs> and mr weasley literally keeps squeezing harry's shoulder until they're fully out of sight and then the second he lets go harry's just like what the fuck was he doing down here if he had business with the minister why wasn't he waiting up at the minister's office mm-hmm to which, like you already basically pointed out, there was a clinking of a large amount of gold. Yeah. So, gee, what might that private business have been? Hmm. There's a little too much business going on. Yes. Just saying. And understandably, Mr. Weasley is pretty upset about this, as he angrily says it's probably about gold. Yeah. Let's be honest, he had his hand on Harry's shoulder more to... Oh, he was grounding himself. Thank you. More to ground <laughs> himself than to do anything else, honestly. Yeah. He probably wasn't even like, oh, there's nothing that Harry could say that would really make this worse, but I could lay into this motherfucker. I might punch this motherfucker <laughs> again. Yeah. And in front of the minister, that's not such a great idea. Mm-hmm. But Mr. Weasley is not stupid, so... He no, yes. Attaches himself to Harry. Sure. Like you do. Like you do. <laughs> But Mr. Weasley also mentions how Malfoy's constantly giving gold to the right people to get himself very well connected mm -hmm. and have influence where he really has no business having influence, which is just basically anywhere. Yeah. In my opinion. Pretty much. He wants to be the man behind the curtain is what it is. I mean, yes, but I also think he wants to be the curtain. <laughs> Yeah. Like, he's just a little too showy to be completely behind the scenes. Yeah. Well, I just mean, like, the way he wants to control the minister. Like, Definitely. The yeah. ministry itself. He wants in there. And the best way he can get well, in is by flashing his money around. So he go and do that. Moldy Voldy wants in there. And Lucius is using his money to help out his boss. Well, yeah. But Mr. Weasley says he's going to leave a note for Dumbledore when he drops him off so that he knows Malfoy's been talking to Fudge again because that's not good. And Harry's just like, no shit, that's not good. Like, mm -hmm. how do you know that the Death Eaters haven't put the Imperious curse on him? He's meeting with them in private. Yep. And Mr. Weasley's like, well, believe me, we've definitely thought about that. But at this point, Dumbledore thinks he's just acting of his own accord. And that's not really much of a comfort. But there it and is. I was going to say, that's worse. Yeah. That's way worse. Nope, he's actually just this much of an idiot. There's a counter curse to Imperius. We could correct that issue? Yeah. You can't fix stupid. Exactly. But by this point, they're on the lift. It stops at the atrium level, and it's not the place to discuss it. So they just head back to the security station so Harry can pick up his wand. And as they're walking past the Golden Fountain, Harry's just like, oh, my bargain. It worked. I got to give them 10 galleons. Mm -hmm. So he takes out his money bag and stops next to the fountain. And as he's looking at it, this gold statue mm -hmm. of the witch and the wizard and then the goblin, house elf, house yeah. elf and centaur. Mm hmm he realizes that it's actually kind of a shitty sculpture. And like even the wizard who looked handsome from afar looks kind of weak to chin and the witch and all of the creatures are all gazing at him adoringly. And it's actually kind of sickening. Yeah. But you know what? The money that goes in there goes to a good cause. And Harry was so happy to be off the hook that he dumps his entire money bag into there. Nice. So. So even though the fountain was a Monet, Harry gave it all his money. <laughs> As if. <laughs> so anyway, back at Grimmauld Place, Harry walks into the kitchen where everyone is, and it's just this immediate like, what's the news? What's the news? Yep. What's the news? And when he tells them that he's cleared of all charges, Ron yells that he knew it, and Hermione, who looks so anxious, like covers her eyes with her hand, and she says that, oh, I knew they would clear you. There was no case against you. And Harry's just like, man, 
considering that everybody thought I was going to get off, you all seem super relieved that I did. (laughs) Just because they know that he should get off doesn't mean that they were confident he would. True story. Yeah. Because Mrs. Weasley's like wiping her face with her apron. Yep. And then my favorite part of this entire chapter <laughs> is Fred, George, and Jenny performing some kind of war dance, complete with the chants, he got up, he got up, he got up, he got up, he got up. He got off. He got off. He got off. <laughs> he got off. He got off. He got off. He got off. <laughs> Mr. Weasley's smiling at this whole big debacle, Mm -hmm. but also has to shout several times to get his children to shut the fuck up because he's trying to tell Sirius that they saw Nazi von douchebag with the minister. And they're still like, he got off, he got off, he got off, he got off. (laughs) Mr. Weasley's just like, knock it off, knock it off, knock it off. (laughs) Shut up, shut up, shut up. But he manages to tell Sirius and Sirius is like, oh, yeah, we'll let Dumbledore know. And Mr. Weasley's just like, all right, well, I need to go address a vomiting toilet in Bethnal Green. Again, trivia question. I know they mentioned it twice. I was like, oh, this is a good one because people had two chances to notice it. Yeah, guys, if you didn't get it, read more. (laughs) (laughs) Read all the things. Read them all, all of the times. If you have to read, read Harry Potter. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes so now mr weasley's gone but fred george and jenny are still chanting probably even more now oh it's just progressively getting louder yeah because mrs weasley's like all right stop it seriously we get it he got yeah. off <laughs> and she's like harry you barely ate breakfast come eat something because that's what mrs weasley does yeah and they're all happily sitting at the table discussing how dumbledore's presence swung it for him even though harry is just like I just wish he would have taken the time to talk to me or, you know, looked at me. Calm down, Eeyore. You got (laughs) off. Just be happy. (laughs) Right? And then these thoughts are interrupted by a flash of pain in his scar and he, like, grabs his forehead and Hermione is the only one who actually notices this because everybody else is just, like, super busy celebrating and sure enough. And shouting, he got off. He got off. He got off. He got off. And Ron's like, well, Dumbledore will probably show up tonight to celebrate with us. Like, Sure. Probably. And Mrs. Weasley's like, probably not. The man is extremely (laughs) busy, which is fair. That is fair. It can't be easy to secretly arrange a counter war. Offensive, yeah. 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 It can't be easy to arrange an offense for a war when everybody is working against you. And the person you're arranging it against is not even showing his presence yet. Yeah. So... And he's trying to, you know, start a school back up for the school year, so... He's got a lot going on. It's a busy time. Full plate. Yeah. Anyway, she can't really say much more beyond that because the he got off, he got off, he got off, he got off (laughs) is just getting so loud that she finally just has to shout at them. Yeah. I know how that goes. Yes. Me too. Sometimes, sometimes you just gotta shout. Mom and teacher life. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just gotta shout. Basically, yes. Shout, shout, let Let it all out. out. These are the things I could do without that chant. (laughs) Would you shut the fuck up with that chant? Yeah. Yeah. That's the way that goes. (laughs) Wow. Moving on. Please. (laughs) Please, let's move on. So now over the next few days, they're just back to the huge cleaning Mm -hmm. up Grimmauld Place. And Harry notices that Sirius has become very moody and tends to just shut himself in his mother's room with Buckbeak a lot more. Aww. And he seems to pretty much just be the only one that's not actually happy that Harry wasn't expelled. Like, he put on a good show at first. He's probably like, oh, that's great, kid. That's really good. Oh, now I'm just stuck here by myself and my godson's not going to be able to live with me. And who am I kidding? I was kind of hoping he'd get expelled so he could and I wouldn't be here alone. Right. He definitely has a smile that's not reaching his eyes. Yeah. In that moment. He's just like, cool, man. Cool. Cool, 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 cool. That's great. Awesome. So happy for you. That's great. I, I got a thing to do. So I'm going to... I'm going to do that thing. Yeah, I'm going to see you later. Bye. Okay? Yep, good job. Congrats again. Yeah. You lucky duck, you. 
So they're working on cleaning out this moldy cupboard in one of the bedrooms. And Hermione is just like, don't you go feeling guilty. Sirius knows you belong at Hogwarts. And I think he's just being selfish. And Ron's just like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's harsh. Who would want to be stuck here by yourself? And she's just like, he's not by himself. This is the headquarters of the order. People are here all the time. And... That's kind of missing the point, I think. Yeah. That's one of those things that's making it worse for him. Yeah. This is one of those times where Ron can understand that better than Hermione because Ron has such a big family. Yeah. And I'm sure he can completely understand with the concept of there's always people around, but that doesn't mean you're not lonely. Yeah, we were just even kind of talking about that earlier. Exactly. So yeah, that's got to suck for him. Like he's mm -hmm. just constantly surrounded by memories of his past yeah and he can't even leave the house either. yeah and people that would come and talk to him and keep him company get to leave mm -hmm. and do stuff and everything that he wishes he could do so it just kind of all around sucks and at least if harry had gotten expelled he'd be an outcast with sirius too yeah it was a bad upside but it was still an upside yeah you know, if it had to happen. And then on top of that, I'm sure Sirius also feels bad that he feels bad. Oh, yeah, definitely. So that's probably why he's just shutting himself away instead of being moody in front of everyone. Yeah. Well, sometimes that just makes you more moody where you're just like, man, and now I feel bad because... I feel bad. Because I feel bad and I feel bad. And I don't want people to know that I feel bad that I feel bad. But I don't want them to know that I just feel bad in general. And so I'm just going to go away. Vicious cycle. Yeah. But anyway, the trio continue talking about all of this until Mrs. Weasley enters the bedroom to check their progress. And she's just like, is that all you've gotten done? And Ron's just <laughs> like, man, I thought you came in here to tell us we could take a break. We've been working nonstop. <sighs> <laughs> and she's just like you're the one who wanted to help the order this is how you help the order not what we meant mom and ron's just like i feel like house elf gosh ron polian dynamite <laughs> but yeah so he feels like a house elf and hermione's just like well maybe that'll make you want to get more involved in spew actually this is a great idea what if we do like a sponsored cleaning of the common room so everybody can see what it's like to be a house elf that might really generate some support. And Ron's over there like, I'll generate your support, <laughs> Hermione. That sounded dirty. <laughs> no, the actual line in the book is, we could do a sponsored scrub of the Gryffindor common room. All proceeds go to SPEW. It raises awareness as well as funds. And Ron's just like, I'll sponsor you to shut up about spew. <laughs> so it was, it was very much in the same vein of what I said. Yeah. Also, I would kick in on that sponsorship fund. Mm -hmm. Just saying. So at this point, though, we're getting close to the end of the summer holidays. And Harry's actually getting more and more excited now that he knows he gets to go back to Hogwarts. And to be honest, he's realized that living at the headquarters of the Order of the Phoenix is way more boring than he would have expected. Who'd have thunk it? And people still won't tell him anything beyond what he got that first night, even serious. Mm -hmm. So they like overhear little bits and pieces when people show up, but nothing is happening except for cleaning. And he's just like, I can't wait to be back at Hogwarts. I can't wait to be back at Hogwarts. Hogwarts, <laughs> see Hagrid, play Quidditch. I can't say any of this in front of Sirius. Right. Yeah. Must stay quiet. Right. And then on their very last morning of the holidays, so the day before they go back, their book lists arrive. And I got to say, Dumbledore and McGonagall are slacking this year, that probably because of the so order. so late, The man. day before. And maybe theirs were just delayed because of them not being in the right place or yeah. I don't know. Like Dumbledore would know where to send it. So would McGonagall, obviously. Yeah. But maybe the other ones were all sent out on time and they just got theirs late because they knew i don't know yeah maybe it was just because they only needed two books so they were like well i mean that's a five minute trip yeah that's easy enough to do yeah but yeah the day before that's pretty super last minute that's damn near ballsy is what that yeah. is <laughs> that's me level of, of <laughs> late that's what that is <laughs> no that would have arrived the day of it would have been be yeah it had been as he's getting off the train at Hogsmeade. Thank God there's a bookstore in Hogsmeade, right? right? 
in an effort to help our friends in Hogsmeade bring some more business, you're not getting your list until you get here. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, so book lists arrive. Mm-hmm. And like you said, it is only the two books. They have the standard book of spells, Grade 5 by Miranda Goshock. And mm-hmm. that is the same person who's written all of them. She's all of the previous ones, yeah. Done all the way up to seven. So mm-hmm. not a shock there. The other one is Defensive Magical Theory by Wilbert Slinkhard, which is interesting because at this point, they still don't know who the Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher is. There is that. And this is exactly why Fred and George apparate into their room again, right beside Harry again, although at this point, he's not even phased. No, he's just like, whatever. They must do this to them multiple times a day because now Harry's just like, hey, Fred, hey, George. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> but they're too busy worrying about who assigned that book because the last they heard, Dumbledore hadn't been able to find somebody to fill that Defense Against the Dark Arts position. Mm-hmm. And they're just like, well, I mean, one died, one lost his memory, one was fired. The other one was stuffed in his own trunk for, you know, the majority of the school year. So mm-hmm. I can't imagine why no one would want this position. The Defense Against the Dark Arts position is kind of like the Wives of Henry VIII. Yeah, especially since we know that you could go back before Quirrell Mm -hmm. and probably have other similar stories. Oh, yeah. Harry and Ron only know the ones that Harry and Ron know about. Definitely. So, yes, that could be quite the song in itself. (laughs) (laughs) Indeed. But anyway, Fred is distracted when he realizes that his brother is not joining in on their fun, talking about all this stuff. Instead, he's just standing there, staring at his letter trying to catch some flies with his open mouth. Hmm. Wonder what's going on. And so he moves around behind him and then mimics his facial expression. I would have loved to see this in the movie. I would have just loved to see Ron standing there gaping at his Hogwarts letter and then Fred moving around behind him and then gaping at Ron's Hogwarts letter (laughs) and then just being like, you've been made prefect? Mm Mm-hmm. So then George just like, give me that. And he like snatches the envelope out of Ron's hand. And sure enough, the prefect badge falls right out of it. Yep. But the twins are both like, what? <laughs> no one in their right mind would make Ron a prefect. Mm-hmm. We thought for sure that it would have been Harry. Of course. He's the favorite. And let's face it, he's out in the halls after bedtime most of the nights anyway. Right? <laughs> just makes sense. Double duty. Gives him permission to meddle a little bit more. (laughs) Exactly. He'd be so good at that. (laughs) But then I just love how they're having this conversation as if Harry and Ron aren't right there. Right. And they're like, you know what? All that mad stuff must have counted against him anyway. So, oh, man, I just realized how disgusting mom's going to be when she (laughs) finds out. And that is probably Ron's exact thought at that moment, too. It's like, oh, man. I don't know. I think Ron still might be in shock at this point. That's true. Because George thrusts the badge back at him. Mm -hmm. And Ron's just like, uh, and hands it over to Harry. He's just like, is this real? (laughs) Is this real life? What do I do with this, Harry? And Harry like takes it from him and he's looking at it. And it's just. The most hilarious timing, because then it just happens to be in Harry's hand when Hermione comes bursting in the room with her own letter and prefix badge. Mm -hmm. And she sees Harry holding the badge and she's like, Harry, I knew it, me too. (laughs) And Harry's like a deer in headlights, like, not mine, not mine, not (laughs) mine. And he just throws the badge. Hot potato, hot potato. Bag it, Ron. I want it. (laughs) He's like, not me, Ron. (laughs) And then Hermione's just like, what? Huh? Not yours, Ron? (laughs) <laughs> she actually tries to pretend she's not surprised but apparently just completely fails at that yeah and the only thing that saves her is mrs weasley entering the room with all of the freshly laundered robes of course and she says that she wants their book list because she's gonna go to Diagon Alley later that afternoon and pick up all the stuff they need and she's just like ron we're gonna have to get you some new pajamas because you're growing like a fucking weed and yours don't fit you anymore fact but she's nice enough to ask him what color he wants Aww. or it was convenient enough that she asked him what color he wants because it gave george the opportunity to say get him red and gold to match his badge <laughs> badge what badge 
well, not even that. Yeah, because Mrs. Yeah. Weasley's so distracted by sorting out their robes that she just goes, matches what now? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so Fred, who just has this very like, I'm just going to get it over with. He means his lovely, shiny new prefix badge. <laughs> and Mrs. Weasley, like, I just imagine her forgetting that she's holding a bunch of laundry and just throwing, throwing it, it all up in yep. the air and just <laughs> shrieking basically the same way Hermione shrieked. And she gets so excited that she basically forgets that Fred and George even kind of exist. Yeah. That's everyone in the family. What are Fred and I, next door neighbors? Kinda. Yeah. (laughs) Poor Fred and George, but also hilarious. Yep. In this moment, I get that it's not huge to the plot that Harry and Hermione and Ron are having this thing about prefects in their year. But why take it out? But this moment would not have taken up that much time. Yeah. And going from the trial to the train was too abrupt for my liking anyway. It would have been nice to have a little transition moment. Yeah, definitely. And this is just so fucking cute. Mm -hmm. They could have even worked it in with everyone singing about him getting off. Yeah. Like, oh, hey, by the way, our Hogwarts letters came. Yeah, it could have all been one scene. It could have maybe five minutes. Nobody would have been upset about five more minutes of the movie. I certainly know I wouldn't. Shit, give me five more hours of the movie. I'm not going to be upset. I'll be happy. (laughs) Right? Exactly. And true to Fred and George's prediction, Mm -hmm. Mrs. Weasley is absolutely disgusting. And she just hugs and covers Ron's face with kisses and just... Equal Ronnie kids, I'm so <laughs> proud of you. This is so wonderful. That's everyone in the family. Blah 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 blah. And then she asks him what he would like as a reward, and Ron's just like, "I get a reward." reward? Yeah. And she's just like, "Well, yeah, we got Percy and Owl, and yeah, you already have one. So, do you want some dress robes?" And Fred and George are like, "Damn it, we already bought him some. We shouldn't have bought him any. This is just some <laughs> friend." And Mrs. Weasley was like, "You always really loved your rat. You want a new rat?" And <laughs> Awkward. Sorry. I feel like that probably just brings up sore subjects no, anyway. Yeah. Would you like a new man? <laughs> it's a man. A man? <laughs> I know you just loved your man before. Oh my stars. Oh my stars. <laughs> anyway. Your father and I are just so proud of you. Ron does not want a new man. Ron decides what he would really like to have is a new broom. And, of course, Mrs. Weasley's face immediately falls because brooms are expensive. And he's mm-hmm. just like, not a really good one. Yeah. Just a new one for a change. Yeah. Just one that's my own. Something that's mine. That was mine first and mine only. Yeah. Something that doesn't smell like Great Aunt Tessie. Right? <laughs> but she sort of hesitates and then it's just like, no, my fucking youngest son just became a prefect. We'll figure this shit out. Yeah. And she agrees to get a broom. And then reminds them all to pack up their trunks, kisses Ron again, and heads out the room. Mm -hmm. At this point, the twins are just like, you don't mind if we don't kiss you, right? It's like, I could curtsy. (laughs) I just love the twins. We didn't get enough of this. Oh, God. We didn't get damn near any of the twins compared to how much we could have had. Yeah. Oh, sadness. But at the same time, they're starting to realize the perks of having their younger brother be a prefect. Mm-hmm. And they're just like, oh, man. Wait a minute. Our rule-breaking days are over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is going to be so tough with the two of you breathing down our necks. All right. And Hermione's getting all indignant, like, we could put you in detention if we wanted. And they're like, no, you won't. You break a lot of <laughs> rules yourself. All right. <laughs> You're not really one to talk. Nope, this is going to go just fine for us. <laughs> And they disapparate with that crack that always comes with disapparating and apparating Mm -hmm. and make it up to their room. And the trio can hear him just laughing hysterically through the ceiling. (laughs) And Hermione's just like, pay them no attention. They're just jealous. And Ron's just like, I don't think they actually are. They tend to think that the people who become prefix are brats like Percy. And I'm not entirely sure how I feel about being classified in the same category as Percy, who's being a total douche nugget right now. Exactly. I'm just saying, I don't think they're actually jealous. However, they've never had a new broom before in their life. And I'm totally fine with them being jealous of that. Mm Mm-hmm. Boom. Ron gets the important stuff. Yeah. (laughs) And he knows that his mom will never be able to afford a Nimbus. 
Mm -hmm. Because those are pretty elite. Those are, yeah. But there's a new clean sweep out and they're not as expensive, but pretty cool. And he's just like, maybe she can get me that one. He's like, I'm going to go catch her before she leaves for Diagon Alley. And he just like dashes out of the room, leaving Harry and Hermione behind just the two of them in this slightly awkward moment. I have to say, though, there is something really kind of endearing about Ron being so considerate about that, about... Well, those aren't too expensive, so yeah. maybe, you know, like, even if it's just in his mind, just like, it'd be really cool if I could have a new Nimbus. That'd be really awesome. That'd be so amazing. But, like, he knows. And he, he knows. knows that it's probably a sore spot for his mom. And he's not over ambitious mm -hmm. in that sense. Yeah. He's okay. He's like, it doesn't have to be the best of the best. It doesn't even have to be anything. It just has to be new and mine. Yeah. That's literally like, that's all I want. The best reward that he could possibly get. Yeah. And I love that. He is so endearing in so many ways that the movie just didn't portray either. Yeah. And it would have been really nice to get a little bit more of this side. Right. I get the feeling the way that the movie portrays Ron, I get the feeling if we did have a scene like this, it would have been like him being disappointed he couldn't have a Nimbus. Probably. Or it would, you know, I that's just kind of the vibe that I feel like they tried to give us in the movie of They'd Ron. They'd certainly find a way to make it comical. Yeah. And to be fair, Rupert Grant was so freaking good at that physical <laughs> comedy. Yeah. But that wasn't all he was good at. No, not at all. And the movie needed more moments like this, I yes, think. Yes, I think so, too. I think this is one of the things that really gives the story so much heart. Mm -hmm. And we got a lot of it in the movies. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I don't watch the movies and still cry at certain things and laugh right. at certain things and love it and appreciate so much about them. Yeah. But I definitely cry and Way laugh harder at the book. and love and appreciate so many more things about the book yeah. that I would have loved to have seen come to life. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, I'm a little bit crazy and my brain keeps taking characters from the movies and, and just superimposing them and yeah. creating them. <laughs> and then I think that I remember them happening and they didn't. See, I kind of wish I had mistaken memories like that. <laughs> I can't even believe the number of times that I've done that. <laughs> I know. You'll tell me. You'll be like, hey, did this actually happen? And I'll have to think about it for a second and go, no. But now I wish it did. Thanks right? for bringing that into my head. <laughs> I know there's a lot of people that don't like to look at the books this closely Mm -hmm. to the movies and they like to think of them as separate entities and i know we even have listeners that are of that same mindset and they just appreciate i mean hell you even have a co-host who's of that mindset <laughs> yes but it's also really neat the way that we keep finding things to appreciate mm -hmm. or things that we maybe didn't even fully appreciate in the books yeah it just goes back and forth it's just making us look at something beloved closer and i'm enjoying the hell out of this i don't know about you i will fully admit that when we first started talking about doing this podcast that was kind of one of my hang-ups was like ah i like keeping the books and the movies separate <laughs> i it will frustrate me too much to have to go through and and note all the differences it's gonna drive me up a wall however it's a fun wall. It is. It's kind of like one of those Velcro walls <laughs> that you run and jump on a trampoline and then stick to with like, like your well, Velcro suit. I live here now. <laughs> yep. And you're just like, this is kind of a fun way to waste an afternoon. Yep. Yeah. That's or in this case, how I feel you know, here. two years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and counting. Oh, counting. Two and a half. Almost five months. Yes. And we still haven't even gotten to Hogwarts. It is a very long book. It is. I mean, it took us a full year to get through Goblet. Yeah. And we didn't have to split nearly as many chapters. No. And this book is longer and I feel like more dense. A lot more dense. So, yeah, this if is... If there had been movie scenes for this chapter being 25 pages long, it could have had to have been split into three. That's, yeah. So... I could have seen dense. that. Dense. Yes. But I don't think we're going to have any three-parters. Based on going through everything ahead of you time. You better knock the fuck on wood right now. There you go. Don't be bringing that karma into <laughs> our lives. What the hell's wrong with you? 
But anyway, this is where we're actually cutting this off for today. Mm -hmm. Since we didn't want to have a seven hour long episode. No, it probably would have been like three. Yeah. All said and done. It would take us forever to record and me forever to edit. And we already recorded one today. And to be honest, Katie and I are both a little bit loopy right now. We're a little done. Yeah. So <laughs> we made it this far. This is where we're going to stop. So we're all set to record for next week, mm -hmm. next time. And as there were no movie scenes, there were no actors. So we don't have anybody to talk about yep. actor wise. So that just kind of takes us right to the Potter pondering. And this time we want to know... What reward would you want if you were made a prefect? Mm -hmm. Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts. Or call us at 216-526-6792 and leave your response as a voicemail. Make sure you start off telling us your name and then go into your answer. And don't forget, you can always stitch your response on TikTok. We really look forward to reading, hearing, and seeing them. And this will bring us to our sorting hat story, which is from Jessica W. She writes, My name is Jessica. I'm 24 and a Hufflepuff. I am very proud to be a Hufflepuff because we are friends to all. My closest friend is a Slytherin. My Patronus is an Osprey. My wand is ebony wood, nine and three quarters inches, which I find very exciting. <laughs> and it has a core of unicorn hair and is quite flexible. Ebony wands favor transfiguration, which is one of my favorite subjects at Hogwarts. My Sorting Hat story starts the year I was born, 1997, the same year that the Sorcerer's Stone book was first released. I grew up completely immersed in the world of Harry Potter because my mom and my older brother both loved the series. I have since become the biggest fan in my family, even though we all enjoy the movies. I don't know how old I was when I first started reading the books, but I have been obsessed for as long as I can remember. I was about six years old when I was first sorted into Hufflepuff. It was at my brother's birthday party, which was Harry Potter themed. My mom made a sorting hat from scratch and my dad performed the ceremony for everyone in attendance. Then when Pottermore was first released, I took the quiz there and since then any other quiz that I come across and every time I am sorted into Hufflepuff. So it is proven that I am a badger through and through. Sorry if I rambled too much. I find it hard to stop talking when it comes to Harry Potter. You and me both. I say so do we. <laughs> You're in good company, <laughs> Jessica. She goes on to say, I absolutely love your podcast. I have been binging all of your episodes and I laugh so much while listening. It's so funny and entertaining. It has really been helping me get through my work days. It's really nice hearing people posing a lot of the same questions that I have and also coming up with similar answers or theories. Keep up the great work. Aww. You're adorable. She sent us a picture, too, to go along with this sorting hat story, and I'm so excited because she is adorable. She is seriously adorable. But thank you so much for sharing your sorting hat story with us, Jessica. We're so excited that you started listening, and we're glad that you've been enjoying it. Yes, we hope to keep you with us for a very long time. <laughs> You're ours now. Mm. We're not evil. What? But yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. And if any of you other keepers out there listening would like us to read your Sorting Hat story on a future episode, you can email it to us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, Patronus, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else that you might want to share with us. Or you can message it to us over social media. This week's trivia question is, what is the handle of Ron's clean sweep made from? The first one who responds with the correct answer and the code word hashtag sportsball will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes or Facebook. Make sure to email us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com to let us know you did, and we'll get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook at JKR Podcast and Twitter and Instagram at Just Keep Rolling. Following us on Podbean at justkeeprolling.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. Make sure to check out our website at justkeeprolling.com and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you would like to help us continue creating more content, you can support us as a patron and get extra perks on patreon.com slash just keep rolling. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated. And join us next week when we talk about the second half of chapter nine, the woes of Mrs. Weasley and the absolutely no corresponding film scenes. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. 
I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. Until the next time, just, just keep, keep rolling. rolling.